Uh, but we're going to go t now, please, to mm -hmm. Geoffrey Robertson, KC, who I understand is online from Australia. He's a very well-known international human rights uh, lawyer who actually wrote about the 1988 massacre um, himself quite a number of years ago. So perhaps we can go to Geoffrey. Jeffrey, we can't hear you at the moment. Can you hear me now? Jeffrey, we can. Thank you very much. And thank you very much for joining us at the Geneva uh, Press Club. We can hear That's you. That's all right. You're rather colder, I guess, than I am in Melbourne. But uh, let yes. me uh, just say, because I'll speak shortly, if my evidence is that which I've collected. Uh, back in 2009, I was asked by the Boromond Foundation to investigate this prison massacre. I'd never heard about it before. Uh, I had just completed uh, five years as president of the United Nations War Crimes Court in Sierra Leone, and so I was uh, <laughs> something of, I knew about war crimes or crimes committed in the course of a war. And as part of my investigation, which took a few months, I in, I spoke to some 40 or 50 survivors of ir Iranian prisons in the 1988-1989 period. And in Washington, I read the newspapers that had, were translated for me from Farsi by the Boromon Foundation that were available covering that period. And I read, of course, whatever other literature was available. It wasn't a great deal because the goings on this terrible massacre had been concealed by the, from the United Nations by Iranian diplomats who lied through their teeth when questions were asked. There was uh, some uh, acknowledgement by Amnesty International that some people were being killed in prisons. The Financial Times had an article. So it wasn't secret, but uh, it was certainly not uh, probed by the United Nations. They had a rapporteur on Iran, Mr. Pohl, who was an extremely naive professor who was fobbed off by the uh, Iranian diplomats who behaved, I think, disgracefully in this uh, by covering up the facts that thousands were being massacred, that they were being dumped in mass graves by ref from refrigerated trucks where their bodies were collected. And, uh, of course, their families were not allowed to mourn. Uh, this is one of the nastiest and cruelest aspects of the killings, that they were not uh, allowed to treat their, and generally they were young people, their parents, their partners, their relatives were not allowed to mourn for them properly, or even to know the actual location of their graves. Now, that was only part of it, of course, because the other matter that should concern us, because prisoners are the most vulnerable of all people. They are at the, the mercy of the state. And that is why international law is particularly concerned for them and why uh, it is so uh, outrageous to treat them in the way these prisoners were treated. And many of them were 
associated with the MEK, which was a political organization, and which theologically was at odds with the uh, religion, the theology of the mullahs, of the Ayatollah, of the regime that had taken over in 79. So when the prisoners were called before a group of three judges that was became known as the death committee and which had often as a member of it the current president of uh, Iran, Mr. Raisi, uh, they were simply asked, it wasn't a trial in any sense, they were charged with being Moharib, a form of blasphemy, not adhering, in a sense, to the theology of the state. And they were asked simply whether they were still in uh, support of the MEK, and if they were, they were simply shunted on to a conga line which led to the gallows. They were hung six at a time in prison auditoriums. It was all, all in, uh, in makeshift gallows, and they were then cut down and put in these refrigerated trucks that were seen leaving the prison for uh, mass graves. But what was, uh, of course, outrageous, was that there was no trial, there was no legal process. The death committee was not in, were not, they were called judges, but they weren't judging. They were simply uh, allocating people to a particular category, which would, uh, of persons who would suffer death. So, that was the iniquity of what was happening. They were not tried, they were killed in, uh, in a, without legal process, without being able to defend themselves, without mercy. And so that was the, the sad event that took place in August and September, uh, pursuant to a fatwa issued by the Ayatollah Khomeini, who was dying at the time of cancer, but that was no satisfactory explanation or excuse for him sending, sentencing these people to death or for other officials implementing his orders which were plainly unlawful, as his deputy, Ayatollah Montezeri, uh, notably pointed out. Well, it was covered up at the time, of course, and uh, now, so many years later, we know much more about it. People are speaking out, and there was a trial in Sweden, uh, at which I gave evidence last year, in which one of the executioners was uh, arrested and sentenced to uh, for crimes against humanity committed in uh, Iranian prisons at this time. So we're catching up with this barbarous event, which was probably the worst crime against humanity uh, in Europe since the Second World War. It was a treatment of prisoners that was akin to the death marches in Japan of American and Australian uh, prisoners at the end of the war in the Pacific. So what can we do? I think it's important, obviously, to hear the evidence as it 
unfolds and more of it unfolds and will unfold even today. Uh, that is one way in which we can remember the victims, uh, but can we punish those who behaved so barbarously? We have now a very effective and uh, well-positioned UN rapporteur, Mr. Raymond, who is here today and uh, is in no doubt of the fact. It is something that uh, will feature, I'm sure, in his reports. Uh, and we can perhaps go further. The Swedish case last year is a very good start, and we can uh, arrest, try, and punish those who played a part in these events back in 1988. There is, of course, the question of dealing with those who are most involved, and they include the current supreme leader, who was president at the time, knew all about it. Uh, we can deal with other members of the death committee who are still uh, in high position. Really, it was just 30 uh, or so, 34, five years ago, and they are still in place. So uh, there has been, there is much discussion in the international legal circles about how to deal with Mr. Putin, who is quite clearly a uh, aggressor, a guilty of a crime against humanity in the tens of thousands of people he's killing as a result of his war in Russia. Je and Jeffrey, there Jeffrey, is okay. a lot of talk of a trial in absentia, and that is something that the UN might consider in relation to the, those who bear greatest responsibility still for the prison massacres of 1988. So I leave you with that thought. Geoffrey, thank you very much. Thank you, Geoffrey.